This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. With me today is Richard Fields in the middle, John Cameron down on the other end. And gentlemen, we have a disturbing report came out a couple weeks ago that democracy is deteriorating worldwide among the pandemic. That, you know, all these uh, authoritarian measures taken to supposedly control you know, the, uh, the disease that can't be named, shall we say. The, <laughs> the fact that we have to have that kind of, you know, use euphemisms to discuss this thing is part of actually the problem. It's, a, it's you know, a very visible and audible uh, this sign that this problem of uh, democracy, freedom, you know, individual rights to speak freely has deteriorated worldwide and it's only getting worse. And the thing is, we don't seem to be dealing with the Voldemort problem very well. Which, yeah, I think we need to distinguish between democracy and uh, liberty or freedom. Democracy is 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 probably the uh, somebody said I forget who it's the best form of government except for or the worst form of government except for all the rest. Democracy in and of itself is not a is not a, is no panacea because it's uh, essentially two uh, wolves and a sheep voting on who's going to be breakfast. But it's better than uh, the wolf being in charge, which is what, uh, it, which is the direction that we're going, which is authoritarian, you know, very straight and simple. Not author, not majority authoritarianism, but uh, oligarchic or uh, individual authoritarians. And right now, we're looking at a medical authoritarian regime, in effect. And uh, it, it has not been. Looking at the evidence, we still have, we still have people getting sick from the. Uh, from the uh, disease that cannot be named, uh, even though uh, the people who are in charge have been just locking down and masking up and doing all kinds of things uh, without respite for the last almost two years now. Hmm. And that's the problem. The problem is that we have allowed medical practitioners to look only at medical results and totally ignore the side effects, the uh, unintended consequences, or, in, or perhaps the intended consequences of what lockdowns uh, can and would and have in fact done, uh, which is essentially, you know, destroy big swaths of the economy, uh, not to mention people's mental health. So uh, we, are, we, are, we are bowing to a medical aristocracy, whether we know it or not. And that's, I think, what's reflected in the statistics on uh, that were that you that you referenced. Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with a lot of that. I know we can't uh, we can't talk about uh, the Comic Con disease. Um, I, I wish I would have sent that. I wish I would have sent everybody an article. But a Yale epidemiologist had a had a nice thing to say about uh, minor bureaucrats having major power. You know. Uh, and that's what we're seeing here. We're, you know, in the States, and, and I think it did, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, I know you will, um, the, the, the independent regulatory agencies started uh, when, in the 70s? In the 70s? Uh, no, they started in the FDR, uh, at least. Yeah. But, the, but the, 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 the great proliferation was, in, was a little bit later. In great society, that, that was a big proliferation, yeah. And so actually what, in the Nixon years, as far as EPA and that, and that sort of thing. One more time, Nixon years. The, the Nixon years is when we saw EPA and some of those organizations begin. And and then you know now we've had the the FDA for a while, but the FDA was kind of a major organization that uh, just got in the way of stuff, but didn't try to actually do anything. Uh, other than you know, prevent new you know drugs and and new devices to come to market to protect people who already had the old devices and were selling them, whether they're good or bad, and then you know they they stepped into uh, um, you know right before the the uh, the pandemic, they stepped in and and decided to do something about the uh, um, opioid crisis um, and decided that they had the power to to do that. And you know, basically, through their their actions, if if it hadn't been for 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 the pandemic, that's what we'd be talking about. So you have you have all these minor uh, bureaucrats and these government agencies 
you know, not only do you have the big boys in the halls of Congress and the imperial presidents that we have in other countries, you know, you have the same thing with, with you know, the, the bummer is they don't have a written constitution in a lot of countries that were seen as very free. And so, you know, like in Australia, everybody said, oh, Australia is a great place to live. Yeah, and sit in, until they started having troops knock on people's doors to check on them. And they had no, you know, constitutional rights. So, um, our constitutional rights are being assaulted and uh, trampled on in the name of I don't know what, because as you pointed out, Richard, all the things that the powers that we let be have done uh, haven't prevented what they uh, said they're going to prevent by doing those activities that have horrible consequences to mental health, economy, children's education, um, and all the rest of that. So, uh, and I think that trend was there even before uh, the panicdemic, but the panicdemic, uh, you know, gave people uh, a license to, uh, li license to, to assume power they didn't have and, and march people about. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know, you know, what to do about it because even if you vote out the current, um, uh, ship of fools and another ship of fools docks in port, the bureaucrats that, that have the, the boots on the street, <coughs> excuse me, will still be in, in essence in power. So I don't quite frankly know what we can do other than be aware of it. Yeah, there was a drug uh, that uh, essentially was the uh, uh, caused birth defects back in the 1950s and uh, <coughs> and, be, and before it was thalidomide. I just had to look it up. I couldn't remember what the name of the drug was, but it was thalidomide caused uh, birth defects. And uh, it was a, a side effect uh, of a drug that was otherwise useful and but not very useful or not very advisable for obviously for pregnant women. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that scare, a very legitimate scare, the FDA, that was one of the, the reasons the FDA was formed. And ever since its, ever since its formation, up until recently, the role of the uh, FDA was essentially to prevent another thalidomide, prevent any uh, uh, unforeseen side effects of uh, a, uh, a difficult or, or otherwise beneficial drug. And interestingly enough, the last couple of years since, since the Trump, and I emphasize the Trump vaccine, Trump was the guy that said we have to have a vaccine pronto. Uh, and ever since the Trump vaccines were, uh, were uh, introduced or, or, or manufactured or, or invented, let's put it that way, uh, by Fi Pfizer and Moderna and so and so forth, the FDA has done a, a, a 180. They're now saying we will not go through the extensive testing to see if there are uh, unforeseen uh, bad side effects. We're just going to approve this thing and, and move on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting uh, turn in policy, and it's been done at the bureaucratic level. There was no act of Congress that changed anything. There was no, there may have been an executive order, but but it was done uh, certainly outside of the legislative process. And uh, uh, these independent uh, regulatory agencies pick and choose too. I mean, recently we talked on the show about the FDA deciding to, after years of fighting vaping, they looked at numbers from around the world and made the wise decision to say that vaping tobacco might be a way to save about a million lives a year from the effects of smoking if everybody switched from smoking to vaping and a way to quit quit smoking. And, um, you know, they, they'd been hands off and, and then they decided they could regulate everything. And this wasn't by through an act of Congress. This was an internal decision made by an independent regulatory agency to choose to take control of a certain market segment and um, and basically shut it down and then pick and choose winners and starting it back up. And this I find unconscionable where when, you know, bureaucrats who are uh, are completely unaccountable to anybody, you can't fire them. Uh, you don't know who hires them. They make up their own rules as they go. Basically, are running our lives. And uh, and I say, uh, you know. What should I say? You can't arrest us all. I don't want to say that. That's a quote from somebody else because I'd hate to get arrested today. Well, part of the problem is when you talk to public policy, there's a lot of this fall of the science, but there is no the science. There's a lot of different sciences that have to be balanced and weighed and measured against each other. And so when you talk about following the science in any singular piece of science, it's you're going to have you're going to get things wrong because you're not actually paying attention to the world as it exists. You're paying attention to some utopian slice of it. That you've created, that you've created and isolated, 
and you're making decisions based upon that. And we pointed out here that, you know, this um, mental health issues and the community distress, we pointed out that it was going to happen a year and a half ago when we all started. That was an inevitable consequence of this going on. So it's not like people didn't know. So we knew that there was going to have negative consequences of, um, of these kind of policies. And for frankly, it's not surprising that mm. mental health is deteriorating. Our communities are deteriorating. The, our love of our fellow man, you know, the, our humanity is deteriorating. Mm. We're looking at our, watch our windows and you watch, you know, smashing grabs and crime is up, murders are up. And we wonder where, where it comes from. Like this dehumanization we've gone through the last almost two years now is, is clearly plays a role. Yeah. And, and, just about, remind, and just to remind people, the scientific method is about putting out a, a theory or a proposition and then trying to prove it wrong. That's been turned on its head. And we, scientists are now putting out a, a theory and saying this is correct and doing everything to quash anything that would prove it is wrong and uh, look only at evidence that supports their, their presupposed notion. Mm. No. Well, we discussed communities in crisis. We're going to go talk on here about California and its communities are in crisis. Um, for the first time ever, Los Angeles and, Calif- and San Francisco at the same time lost population. There Fewer people are moving to California, so we're actually, again, still continuing to lose population. And it's actually accelerated in the last year. So this disintegration and this isn't just people moving this is a disintegration of families and communities families are being torn apart communities are being torn apart organizations are being torn apart because people say i can't live here anymore because i can't afford to live here or i can't stand the political culture whatever it is these are families and communities getting ripped apart and we don't talk about it that way there's so far too many people who are too comfortable with their fellow californians leaving I think, I think we have a, a situation in, in California. I mean, we have a federal system where each state, to a certain extent, has uh, control over its own, own destiny. I mean, we've got a, an omnipresent federal government that's uh, minimizing that. But we still have an awful lot of the power, political power, residing at the state level and at the local level, for that matter. And to the extent that California is... Uh, in the vanguard of change, of progressivism, or as John would say, regressivism. Uh, we have uh, California being the, the, the state, along with New York and uh, a few other states, that are the uh, most prone to regulate, the most prone to uh, mess with people's lives in a meddlesome way, the most Karen-like uh, government in the, in, in the, in the country. And people are getting tired of caring. People are saying, "Yeah, the heck with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go uh, to a a state that is more respectful of individual liberty, more respectful of my right to earn a living, more respectful of uh, live and let live." Yeah. Oddly well, enough, more respectful of diversity, which we claim yeah. we like here in California, but we don't. Well, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, San Francisco is is very forgiving of everything except for Republicans. So. Um, I, I, I agree with you. And, and it's, it's uh, you know, I think probably we should talk about Portland uh, in, in another show uh, about what's going on there, because I think that's, that's, you know, what California is starting to look like, even though the mayor of Oakland, we talked about it on the last show, has decided to hire some cops as well as doing all the interventionist stuff they were doing. It's, it's particularly egregious here because um, you have uh, a governor leading the charge, and a supermajority of uh, regressives in the houses, uh, and you're, they're still sitting on this gold mine called, you know, Silicon Valley that's producing all the cash that allows them to be foolish. And you know, if they if they screw around with it long enough, with with remote, you know, learning and all the rest of that, they're going to continue to lose the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, and then you know, they're going to have to do something about the problem until that, you know, until they, they uh, can't borrow enough paper, or have the, uh, um, you know, the federal government uh, pitch in to bail them out like they're doing with the changes in the salt tax. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's just going to continue to grow uh, south. Uh, I think there, there is some, some good news out there on the regulatory front or on the personal freedom front. Um, and it's one of the one of the articles, I don't want to try to take over your job, James, but but we, we did have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel about a court victory at the ninth uh, at the Ninth Circuit, didn't we? 
Yeah, we have some we have some light at the end of the tunnel at the end of the show. So we we coming okay. down the pike. We do have some light at the end of the tunnel coming on. But I want to point out that California, despite all of its progressivism, we lead the country in poverty, and the progressivism has literally made everything worse. And yet we got blinders on. The vote blue, no matter who crowd has blinders on and refuse to hold themselves accountable. They just refuse to do it. I mean, it's you know, if for most of us, if we make mistakes. You know, we, okay, we screwed that up. We're going to go back. We're going to try to fix what we can, but we're going to try to not make that mistake again. And here in California, it's like, well, we screwed that up. We made these mistakes. So let's double down and do some more. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at the world, you look at, uh, at, at leftist or socialist or progressive ideology. It's an ideology that uh, is above all full of hubris. It's full of uh, we are correct. We must make the world conform to our ideas. Uh, and if you know, and, and if we have to break eggs in the process, as Lenin said, famously said, you got to you got to break eggs to make an omelet. Uh, and if you look at the Soviet Union, they went for decades before they finally uh, imploded and finally figured out that uh, well, maybe uh, capitalism is uh, just a little bit okay. Also, same way with China. Uh, same way with Venezuela. They have not yet pulled out of the uh, tailspin that they're in. They will, uh, hopefully, eventually, but it takes a long time before uh, the people who are, most 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 people are, are apolitical. They don't care about politics or they wish they didn't have to care. Uh, but at some point, they get hungry enough and uh, homeless enough and, uh, de- you know, their liberties are trampled up upon enough so that they say, to hell with this. We're not going to cooperate anymore. That's what caused the downfall of the Soviet Union. That's what led to the uh, the uh, Joe and Lei uh, capitalist revolution in China. That's what has always brought uh, tyrannies out of uh, out of control of the of the tyrants. The only thing that keeps a tyranny going is the willingness of the vast majority of the population to say, "I'll obey." Mm. Yeah, they, there's a nice T-shirt making the rounds. They can't arrest us all, but uh, they, you know, they they'll arrest the ringleaders. So I'm not a ringleader. I'm not. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I'm 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 too old and small to go to jail. So um, yeah, it's you know the 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 problem is that you know we we talk about how horrible things are and uh, there's a bunch of problems and the world's going to hell in a handbasket and all the rest of that. Yet, even at a reduced quality of life, we're, we're still, I do a gratitude journal every day. You know, we still have tons and tons and tons of things to be thankful for. I'm not looking forward to the, to the, uh, the horrors of, of drastic change from the, the, um, the bureaucrats that we have running everything now to a little more freedom because what, what typically happens is that the uh, regressives uh, who don't, you know, care, they say, as Richard pointed out, the ends justify the means, um, are usually win revolutions, at least initially, because um, they are willing to do anything to win. Whereas nice folks who, libertarians, who, you know, believe in letting people let live and let live and you can do whatever you want, um, don't win. So it you know, we're in, we're in for, I think, a lot of mess. And I don't really, I know there's a few lights at the end of the tunnel. One of them, and I wish I would have sent it out. Maybe we'll do it. Let's, let's discuss another time. Is apparently uh, Mr. Bloomberg has decided to uh, spend a whole lot of money fighting teachers unions in the state of California, which sounds, you know, anti, you know, non-Bloombergish to me. But I mean, if, if the real, if the people that control the purse strings of the regressives are looking at what's going on and, and willing to step up, and make some changes, maybe there is hope. I don't know. Yep. Well, in New Jersey, the Scrooges are running around. There's not much hope in New Jersey. Uh, Newark, New Jersey wants to uh, regulate churches and other activity and other community groups um, feeding the homeless. He's sitting here on one hand. Yeah, they wanted they wanted to to ban feeding the homeless by any, anybody other than the uh, the government. Uh, unfortunately for Newark political leaders, uh, they, it made media, and they were embarrassed into saying, "Oh, well, never mind. We won't ban uh, feeding the homeless. We'll just regulate it to death. We'll just uh, say you have to get so many permits that it becomes impractical." Uh, it's a it's a it's a clear example of the government 
insisting upon having a monopoly and then totally messing it up. Mm -hmm. Haven't we learned from the fact that the post office is a monopoly and provides terrible service? DMV is a monopoly that provides terrible service. Uh, education is largely a monopoly, certainly an oligopoly that has been inflating at a rate that is double uh, or triple the rate of inflation for the last 20 or 30 years. Haven't we seen that uh, medicine, uh, largely a government monopoly or oligopoly, has also seen inflation that has been in, far in advance of the general economy? Government monopolies are dysfunctional and a government mon monopoly on charity serves two bad purposes. One, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, provide services to the homeless or to the poor. And two, it makes it impossible for anybody else to step in to the detriment of the poor. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Richard uh, on this. And I was talking to my, my buddy, Dwayne, uh, who has ministered to the homeless for years and years and years. And, and I threw off some off cuff, you know, remark about spending more money. He said, John, they don't need to spend any more money. They, they got plenty of money. What they have is, you know, you know about the military industrial complex and you know about the educational complex that, that the, the, the colleges are in cahoots with the politicians and, and uh, you know, the banks and all the rest of that. But the, there is a, a huge industry, especially in the state of California now, and, and it sounds like they want to create one in Newark. Uh, around homelessness. You know, there's all these NGOs and nonprofits that get grants. There's all these politicians that do the programs. There's all these taxes and, and the staff and all the rest of that. And so as any other go, uh, government program, a crisis or an appearance of a crisis becomes an opportunity to create ever larger bureaucracy and uh, ever greater layers and hand power out and hand out favors. And so that's what's happening here. You know, we they we throw a ton of money at the at, at homeless people in in the state of California, and there's more of them all the time. So it's not it's not throwing money at into the hands of politicians to deal with it. There's there's many churches that do a, a magnificent job getting homeless people off the street. You know the the twenty percent that you can never do anything with, they write them off. But the ones that are you know, borderline because they've some, had something in their life and they're transitional homeless. Homelessness is, isn't isn't a, a condition. It, it's, a, um, what am I looking for? The word for it. It's a symptom, you know, and and so they're they're throwing money at the symptom, but there's all sorts of different kinds of homelessness. And, and you know, that's just one of the problems in the state. And, uh, you know, it's a symptom of... Uh, ineffective mental health care because the full-time homeless, probably 60% of them are mentally ill and, and do need some help. But, you know, just saying everybody homeless is the same. You've got maybe 20% that are transitional and, and could, with a little help and a little bootstrapping and some guidance and being held accountable, could get a job because there's a lot of jobs open right now, let me tell you. Yeah. And John, I don't want to cut you off, but we, we wanted to get to the, we don't have time to get to your little positive story and the end of it. But the whole point is there's a lot of money in homelessness and it's not the homeless that get it. It's, it's the service industry that, you know, the industry that has been built around that, that is actually the issue. But uh, recently here in Amador County trade school has won a Supreme, a Supreme court fight against yeah. California, allowing themselves to actually educate people without having to those students to get a GED. Now, this is a horseshoe farm. These are teaching people how to horseshoe, how to put horseshoe. And so the state wanted to require them to have GEDs and high school diplomas. And it says, none of that's relevant to putting a horseshoe on a horse. And so they finally got the courts to acknowledge that, you know, this is dumb. This is just a regulation for regulation's sake. And it was actually a, a violation of the First Amendment of not just the, the school, but the students. The students have a right to, to learn how to put horseshoes on, and the state doesn't have the right to interfere. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful thing. And, and I think it was the Ninth uh, Circuit, which is, you know, headquartered in San Francisco and usually pretty lefty and, and always believes in the state. But, you know, we have we have a real educational problem in this in this country because 
you know, the diploma mills want to shove everybody into college because that way they take out the big student loans and then they can pay the big fees and, and the universities can expand and expand and expand and people can require greater and greater degrees to do things they don't need degrees for. Maybe this, you know, is the turning point because you certainly don't need uh, a high school diploma to learn how to do an, an enormous number of jobs that are open in this country that with a little training, a little technical training, if you can read, read, write, follow instructions, work hard, uh, and do a little math, you should be able to, and without all these regulatory barriers, you would be able to, to make a darn good living and fill some of these open jobs. And I hope this is the start of a trend. It's a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Yeah. Is that anything to add, Richard? Well, yeah, no, I agree. I agree that uh, you, John mentioned you don't need a high school degree to do a lot of these things. You certainly don't need a college education. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, due to the way that we fund uh, higher education, including trade schools, there's an awful lot of scam trade schools out there. But if we simply took away the, the uh, federal funding, the cost of trade schools would go way down and we would have uh, a much more effective and functional uh, system for trading pe or training people to be effective and uh, be able to make a good living in the trades. Yeah. And well, John is talking about following instructions. There's a short little story here to end this. A professor, and I don't off the top of my head remember where he was, but he's a music professor and his syllabus, in his syllabus, he put in a, a note to class that says, if you go to this locker, the first person to this locker and gave the combination and there's a surprise for you. There was 50 bucks in a locker in his syllabus. And all he had to do was, as John says, follow the instructions and work a little hard. It's not even hard work. You just have to go to a locker and open a thing. And they could have won 50 bucks at the end of the year. The money was still there. The lock had not been changed. All these highly educated students didn't bother to read the syllabus. <laughs> you know, that's really more of a commentary on all of the legalese that we're uh, faced with on a daily basis. When we look at uh, downloading any app on our iPhone or any new program on our computer, we have to sign off and say, you know, check a little box that said we've read 60 pages worth of legalese uh, mm -hmm. before they'll sign us up. Nobody reads that 60 pages of, of legalese. Likewise, the syllabus, uh, syllabus or syllabi are now full of legalese. Nobody reads them either. And this is like a good, uh, a good proof of that. Yeah, and I, I uh, maybe it's, it's time for them to, you know, cut some of the, uh, the, the, the verbose language that I get sidetracked into on occasion and uh, keep it short and simple. And uh, kiss. Keep it simple, sweetheart. And, you know, again, life is life is all about uh, reading those contracts, and I don't do it anymore. And and I, I read one of them about halfway through, and it was indeed 30 pages of Red 15. And it basically gave the software company the right to live inside my computer and do whatever they wanted with the information they found and give it to anybody they wanted to, no matter what I said later, just by agreeing to use that software. I'd given up, you know, all yep. my privacy. And we give up all of our time. I want to thank you guys for being with me today. I want to thank you for watching. Have a Merry Christmas. And please remember to love everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you guys. And my high holy days tomorrow, winter solstice. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show in Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast, each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty.